Welcome to this workshop on how to build secure contract using fuzzing. Um, before we start, just to get like a sense, how many of you have used Echidna in the past? Echidna? It's a, what we're going to present. <laughs> okay. Okay, so who are we? So Gustavo Greco and myself, Roslin Feist. We are both security researchers at 12 Bit. If you don't know us, uh, we are a company where we specialize in high-end security technology. Uh, we have expertise in blockchain, but also in other topics. For example, we do a lot of cloud native application or we do a lot of cryptography with like ZK stuff. And so something that I think differs us from other companies is that we spend a lot of time trying to apply research and program analysis into like our daily job. As a result, we have built a lot of open source tools. You might know Slitter, which is a static analyzer for Solidity, Echidna, we are going to talk about it today. Uh, but we have a lot of other tools, for example, Tiller, which is a static analyzer for Algorand, Armana, which is a static analyzer for KO, and so on. Four techniques. The first one is using unit test. The second one is using manual review. And the two last techniques are using fully automated or semi-automated technique. I'm assuming everyone here is familiar with unit tests. Uh, you should use unit tests, and they are good usually to cover uh, that the system is working as expected in the happy path. Something that we have learned over our audit and uh, you know, over the analysis that we have done is that there is no correlation between the quality and the quantity of the unit test and the likelihood of having high, high severity vulnerability. And this is, we actually have an academic paper on this where we have uh, looked over like all the audits we have done and this is a, a correlation that we have not found. And the reason why um, our intuition tells us that when you are going to write unit tests, you are going to try to cover happy path, things that are supposed to do in the, in the correct execution, while vulnerability usually lies in the edge case, in the things that you haven't considered. The second, oh, this is an example of a uh, unit test. The second technique that you can use is manual review. So you can go line by line and try to understand what the code is supposed to do, what is actually doing, and if there is like a, a difference between both. Doing manual review requires specific set of skills. It's time consuming, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to do. Usually you are going to go through a security company to do a security assessment um, to have people that have this specific set of skills. The next technique that you can use is using a fully automated tool. Um, these are like the tools that are going to find um, some of the common bugs. You're just going to click on a button and the tool is going to tell you there is this type of bug or not. Uh, for example, you might know Slitter, which is our static analyzer for Solidity. This type of techniques might give you false warning, um, but they are also really powerful because they might cut, you know, like uh, critical bugs. You, oh, yeah. Okay. So, okay, so for Slitter, like the best technique is spend one hour like the first time you try it. Uh, there is a triage mode, so once you have triage, like the result, they won't show up like in the next execution. And if it takes you like one hour and at the end of the day, you might be able to catch critical vulnerability, I would say it's worth going through the first result. And like we, are, we have like a list of trophies for uh, Slitter that demonstrates that we have found a lot of like actual bugs using it. So yes, there is like a, a false positive pass for, for, for false alarm, but it's not going to take you so much time and it's going to provide you value. For example, we have a GitHub action with Slitter um, when you can connect it to GitHub on every pull request commit, depending on how you are going to configure it, it's going to run if, to see if you are introducing new, new vulnerability. Yeah, uh, perhaps, uh, sorry, perfect, perhaps next uh, year we will do a, a Slitter workshop on Yeah, <laughs> And this is open source and it's free. Okay, the last technique that you can use is using semi-automated analysis. So these are going to be tools for which you are going to provide some information, for which you are going to have a human uh, intervention to explain to the tool what you are looking for. And this is a bit more difficult to use because it requires like this interaction for, from, you know, from the user. It's a technique we are going to see today with property-based testing with Echidna. So what is property-based testing? 
To understand how it works, um, I have to introduce fuzzing. So fuzzing is a standard program analysis technique that is used a, a lot in traditional security. The idea is basically you provide a random input to the program and you try to see what, what's going to happen. You try to stress this with random input. The most trivial uh, fuzzer that you can write, you just go on your keyboard and you know you, you patch random bottom and you see what, what's going to happen on your program. Um, again, it's well established in traditional security. We have a lot of tools, AFL, leap further, go further, and so on. However, most of the traditional further are going to look for memory corruption, for crash in the program. We don't have a lot of memory corruption on Solidity. There are some, but they are not that common. What we are going to try to look for is a property of the system that can be broken. And this is why we call it property-based testing. Basically, the way it works is that the user is going to define invariants. The further is going to uh, explore randomly the program and is going to try to see if the invariants hold or not. You can think of, of uh, fuzzing really as like unit test on steroid, where with unit test you try uh, one specific value with a program, while fuzzing is just going to try randomly a lot of different values. I've been talking a lot about invariants, so what an invariant? An invariant is something within your system that should always be true. It's something that should never uh, be false or that should never be not possible to check if it's actually uh, holding. So I have talked also about Echina. So Echina is our further for smart contract. It's open source. Uh, we have been using it for like four or five years even now uh, in all our audits. You can see a list of uh, mature code base actually using and have integrated Echina in their process. For Echina, we are focusing on the uh, you know, ease of use. So the invariants are going to be ex uh, um, described in Solidity. We have a GitHub action similar to Slitter. And we support all the compilation framework. If you use Foundry, Ardart, Brony, uh, Truffle, whatever, we are going to support it because uh, we are using it in every of our audit and uh, every now and then someone comes with a new compilation framework. Okay, I was talking about invariants. So let's say you have a token. You have an ERC20 token. It has you know, a balance. You can transfer token. What would be an invariant? An invariant could be that if you have a total supply, no user in the system should have more tokens than the total supply, right? If you have 10 million of tokens, if a user of 20 million, yeah, something is wrong. The way it works is that you're going to take the contract in Solidity, you're going to define invariants, uh, which are going to describe what you are trying to check. One way to do that is to create functions that are called echina underscore uh, some name. This function should return a Boolean. If the Boolean is true, the property holds. If the Boolean is false, um, the property is broken. You give both to Echidna. Echidna is going to explore randomly the program and is going to try to see if it holds. OK, and now it's the part for you. So we, have, we are going to have a couple of theory of exercise where you're going to try to apply Echidna and to define some invariant on the system. You can go on this repo, or you can scan the QR code of the repo. Check out uh, the DevCon branch and open the first exercise. If you have any problem to install a kid now, if you have any question, uh, let us know. We also, we also welcome everyone who is not um, into the exercises just to see. Uh, even, even if you already uh, know how to, do, how to do testing or even if you, if you use fasting every day, uh, it's, it's totally fine. We will happy to take uh, any questions, simple or more advanced, about how, how Echidna works. So please feel free to, to do it. And we will take 15 minutes for this, uh, for the first one. Okay, so the question was, uh, what are the benefits of using Echidna over Foundry? Um, so first, I think Echidna has more features than Foundry at the moment. They, they were developing Foundry for like six months. We have been using Echidna in like uh, four years. 
Um, we support any compilation framework. So let's say you are using RDAT because you want to do integration tests and you need some complex setup using like TypeScript or whatever. If you move to Foundry, you're going to have issue because it's more difficult to you know, create this type of test. So you end up in a situation where you need to have a setup with two different compilation framework. If you use some advanced options, then you have to need to, need to have like both advanced options in both compilation framework if they support it. And it's a lot of you know like maintenance. Um, here we are like you know agnostic to the compilation framework in that sense. We have uh, we're going to talk about that later. We also have like a couple of advanced features that um, the other further don't have. For example, something that you can do with Echidna is that instead of trying to find uh, invariants that are broken, you can look for functions that cons consume most of the gas. So you can list the further one and give you a summary of, okay, I can run this function with this parameter and it's going to output this amount of gas. And if you are looking you know, for um, this type of things, uh, it's, it's really nice. Hey there, uh, Brock from Foundry here. Um, I'm curious, uh, how do you go about benchmarking uh, a fuzzer, right? So how do you, because um, it's something like, for us, it's just a black box. Yeah. And yeah. OK, that's a really good question. And even in like traditional feathering, you know, like if you go like in the literature of how feather are benchmarked, I would say that most of the benchmarks are poor. Or one of the issues is that when someone does a benchmark to you know benchmark their own tool, there's a bias, right? So we we have benchmark, we have our own benchmark to try to see you know like in our past audit and everything how it works and everything. But obviously we have a bias, like it works well for us because we are you know building the tool on our example. Um, so I would say like the best place to have like a, a good benchmark for fuzzing should not come from tool developer. Uh, that's my advice. Yeah, yeah, it's it's also an open question. What is your benchmarking? Like if you if you are if you're saying, well, this is faster than this other thing, but it could be executing just always the same thing, like you know, calling a constant function over and over again is going to be faster than calling some deep, deep part in the in the code. Uh, on top of that, you have like bugs. What are, what about like finding bugs? How much bugs you found? And there is there are a couple of academic papers saying that. Some people uh, like to compare this, but you have a, like, um, like a plot saying how many bugs you found. And let's say that one faster is better than the other, but you don't know if the, in the next hour you will have a, 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 a peak saying, well, this found a lot of things. So there are other things that you can do. So you can use coverage, but also coverage is not going to give you like a, a, a uh, it's not going to be the the ultimate answer, so it's it's still uh, a debate how long you should run uh, faster for a benchmark or even for you know testing something. Uh, it's also a debate what you what we should use for benchmarking. Uh, should we use like complex DeFi applications? Like, but how many of them we have? Like ten or twenty? We don't have thousands of different DeFi, so it's it's. Uh, we we ref definitely are interested in a deeper discussion on how to have a good benchmark set for for tooling. And we have the same problem, for example, with Lita, where uh, how do we benchmark that our static analyzer provide good results? And it's tough. Um, we usually tend to have a practical approach in the sense that if the tool provides value during our audit, if it helps us, you know, to find bugs and make us faster, that's good enough for us. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, also depends on the invariants. If the if the if the developers don't know how to write good invariants, then no tool is going to provide some magic um, value. So it's 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 tough. Okay, okay, and and happy to discuss with 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 the foundry team or any other team doing doing fasting. We will we'll be here uh, today. So please let us know. Okay, okay. my okay. other question is regarding like. The tool is only for fuzzing, or it support like symbolic execution or something like that. So yeah, you want to? Yeah, it's it's only for fuzzing. We have another tool for symbolic execution, which is called Mantica. However, uh, and something actually we're, we're going to discuss later. I think in practice, any formal based method approach is going to have a lower return on investment at further. Uh, if you have two weeks, three weeks to work on a project, you know, and you want to invest some resource to increase your confidence in the project, 
fuzzing is the best solution. Yes, and uh, and also we found that so um, Echidna is a tool that works with our uh, static analyzers leader that gets value. So you have in some cases like let's say that you have a test that says if x equal to some some value. Some uh, uh, traditional faster techniques have hard time to deal with this, but what we what we do is constant mining. So we ex scan all your code, look for these magic values, and we replay these magic values and some mutation of that from time to time. So our faster should be able to get inside the inside this if you if you if you have a, a test case that is not that is not uh, working. Please let us know, and we can try to to see it. But in practice, it seems like some of the typical use cases for symbolic execution in which you have constant uh, uh, magic values to to look for, they can be replaced by uh, constant mining extraction. How many of you have issued to install a kid now to one like the exercise? Uh, how many of you have issue like installing a kidna or opening like the different exercise? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, no, you 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 have to open your terminal and a kidna will deploy the. So you need to install install the tool and when you put like a kidna te a kidna test some contract, you will compile it running inside the simulated uh, blockchain and give you the answer. So you don't need to connect into something. Uh, so yeah, go into the, um, into the repository and it says like, yeah. So yeah, this is like the, the original one, but if you go into the uh, DevCon branch, yeah, that is that is one, one thing that, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it's, it's it has, more specific, yeah. So, so over there, you said like if you are using Mac, you can do that, that, or you can download. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, wanted to highlight one one little feature that we are testing on on Echidna that is that is also using fuzzing, but instead of testing a property, where we are doing minimization or maximization of some value. So, this is an, uh, a new thing that we are that we are testing. It is not property based testing. But it's it's something it's something that we are trying that we are trying to push. So if you want to know if a user is it's capable of uh, extracting tokens from your system without you to realize, you can use that feature. Just saying, uh, hey Echidna, can you maximize this balance of this account? So it will try to generate you the maximum uh, sequence. So it's 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 a little bit outside this, but uh, it's something that we wanted to mention. Okay, so our target here is a token. Um, it has a transfer function, uh, like a classic transfer function. It inherits from a, a posable uh, contract, which is like a basic posable system. And what we want to try to do here is to create the invariants, such as no user should have a balance above the total supply. To test the token, the way we are going to do it is that we are going to inherit the token or target. We are going to create the contract test token. We are going to initialize the balance of the caller, so of the first user, um, to uh, 10,000. And this is an initialization. So you are creating a token. There is 10,000 in one address. And now the invariant is simply that. Um, no user, so the user Echidna color should not have more than 10,000 token. Again, you deploy a token, 10,000 token to one user, this user should never have like 20,000 token, right? And if you run this with Echidna, Echidna is going to tell you that this invariant, this property on total supply was broken, it failed. And it's going to tell you how. And the answer is that it just call the function transfer with a destination address zero and 10,093 token. So what happened here? 
Um, this was compiled with Solidity 0.7, so there is no overflow and underflow protection. So there is an underflow problem here where uh, if you try to send more, more tokens that you have in your balance, uh, the balance is going to underflow and you know you have a really large um, balance. Something which is interesting here is that we define the invariance, you know, without looking at the code, without looking at the function, we were not looking is there any issue in the transfer function. We just define an invariance. And by doing so, we can realize that there is a bug in the transfer function. Um, so this is a kind of a nice uh, way of trying to find bugs because you don't look at the individual function necessarily. You can just define invariant and the further is going to try to break the invariant for you. Does that make sense? Any question? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so the question is, does it execute a specific function or do, how does it know which function to call? The answer is that it's going to call everything. So in this token, uh, if you look at like the, the whole source code, you have a transfer function, posable function, and uh, like uh, some additional function. So the further is just going to call everything and everything external or public, like everything that a user can call. Okay, the question is, if you have a very large token or a very large contract, you have a lot of function. So here you can take different approach. Either um, you want Ekina to call everything and you just do nothing and you let Ekina run, uh, which might work, no, it depends on what it is. If you know that some functions are more important and you want to target, uh, you can change in the configuration, option, uh, configuration file of Ekina and tell him call only this function or don't call this function. Uh, so it depends on what you are trying to look. If you want to increase your confidence, you should call everything. If you think they might have an issue in a specific function and you want to focus on that, um, you, you can you can blacklist or whitelist. Okay, so the question is, can you define the order of call? You can define the order of the initialization, uh, but not after that. I think there was another question. No, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the question is, um, can you have like a better log? Because obviously this is like a simple example. Uh, and when you do random you know, exploration, you might call a lot of functions that are not necessary for what you are trying to, to, to call, right? And the answer is yes. Um, so Echidna does what we call shrinking, where once it found uh, a way to break the invariant, it's going to try to reduce the trace. So it's going to continue to fuzz more or less on the same you know, uh, iteration uh, and trying to reduce like the size of the, of the trace. Okay, then we have um, the second exercise. Same instruction. <laughs> so on the same repo, uh, just call exercise two. It's on the same target, so you're going to try to have an invariant um, on the same token. The first invariant was that no user should have a balance above total supply. Here, as we kind of hinted before, uh, this is a posable system. So it's a system where the owner can pose or unpose the system. And what we want to verify, the invariant we want to have, is that if there is no owner, and the system is paused. Can someone unpause the system? And this is what we're going to try. And yeah, let's take 10 minutes for this one. I'm going to show the solution for the second one. So, it's the same target that for the first exercise, but here we are going to focus on the contracts that were inherited by the token. You have two tokens, uh, you have two contracts, sorry, ownership and posable. And here you have a system where you have an owner and you can pause or resume the, the contract. And what we want to check is that if we drop the ownership and we pause the system, is it possible to unpause it? So here we have a bit of initialization to do right because we want to drop the ownership and we want to pause the system. 
we are doing this in the constructor. So we are calling pause and honor. From now on, the system as a contract is deployed, it's pause, there is no honor. The invariant is then just if the variable that you know, tracks the, the possible state of the system is true. And this should hold, right? You pause, no ownership, it should be always paused. And Equinot tells us that it actually failed. And the reason for that, so this is kind of like an old uh, bug that were really frequent and common in all versions of Solidity. There was no constructor keywords. And the way you were doing the constructor is that you needed to have the function name, which was a match with the contract name. And here you have the contract ownership and a function owner. And because of that, the function owner is a public function and anyone can call it and become the owner. This does not work anymore with more you know, modern version of Solidity, uh, but it's the type of bug that we are uh, finding a bit more, uh, a, a bit too much uh, in the past. Something which is interesting again is that, you know, we did not look at the ownership contract. We did not look like at the implementation itself. We just defined an invariant and we let the one of uh, the further one and it found the invariant for us. So now bring the question on how to define invariant. Okay. Okay. So the question is, is uh, defining invariant part of the auditor, you know, work? Uh, yes, like we are using a kid in our audit and during our audit, we are going to define invariant. Uh, and something we are going to do is that we are going to discuss with the developer because de the developer know, you know better than us what the system is supposed to do. So we are going to have this collaboration uh, with them to understand what the, super, the system is supposed to do and to define this invariant. Note the question how to define invariants. Because, you know, like, if you have bad invariants, it doesn't matter what you are doing. You know, if you are using further, if you are using like formal method, if your invariants are not good, you are just going to check for something that, you know, doesn't matter. The best approach to write invariants is not to start with a tool, it's not to start with, you know, writing down solidity invariant, it's to start with English. Open a file, a markdown file, or whatever you know, uh, format you like, and write in English what the system is supposed to do. Start simple. Start with invariants that you know, you know are true. Start with things that are not broken. Once you have five or ten simple invariants, write them in solidity. And one the further on top of them. If the invariants are all holding, then you can go back to thinking about the invariant of the system and, you know, go more uh, deeper into, into the invariant themselves. If something is broken, then look if the invariant is incorrect or if there is an actual bug. And iterate, go over. Um, yeah, in, in our experience, when we work with, uh, with, um, with clients, when we ask them to do step one and define the invariants, they are actually, uh, they, they realize about bugs. So it, it is already a good, a very good thing to start thinking into that. Even if you don't, if you're not testing. Yeah. yeah. But what about testing on the test? What are the functions of each? Break the series block. The series block was founded by block block. And still, can I make a payment board and use this for a Okay. Okay, so if I understand correctly, the question is that can we connect this to mainnet? Yes, mainnet or somehow maybe we can use it with other contracts. Okay, okay. Okay, how to use it with other contracts? So you can just in the constructor deploy the contract. Uh, something that we are not going to cover here, but we have a tool which is called Itino, um, which is basically going to take your unit test, take like your, your suite, and we play them in a kidna. So for example, if you have like a complex integration with like, you know, you are deploying in your unit test 10 different contracts, you are deploying like a mock of Uniswap or whatever you know you need, and you can replay this in a kidna so that everything is, is going to be set up. Yes, yes. I I, uh, I think there is some a little bit something else there that you want to, what if you want to define an invariant on a Uniswap contract? Right, that you that you are using, that your contract is 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 using. So you will need to know how Uniswap uh, uh, works in order to put it in your invariant. Like if I'm swapping something, then I'm getting something else, right? 
And in that case, you need to realize that it's difficult to write invariance with other people code, right? Despite despite this is working and everyone is is using it, but every time that you use a third party contract, then you have you are importing some risk, and you need to completely understand the other contract in order to know what is going to the effect in your own contract. Yeah, I, I, I just an explanation. So what was the case? Have a special type. So the risk case was we have a special, uh, I'm from Gearbox protocol and we work on composable leverage and we have adapters because we just provide leverage for some uh, other contracts. So when you combine Gearbox with Uniswap, you get immediately um, a margin trading. And in this case, we have adapters and these adapters incorrectly parse path to make check after Uniswap. However, they integrated and make call to existing Uniswap and guy who were on Immunify problem, he write a small test and this test show us that if you really add some uh, additional part of call data, it could be interpreted incorrectly. So we have a two different ones. Our system could be fooled, check not that balance we should be checked and in this case it was a fault of the system and the funds could be drained and in this case i think we could find some fuzzing testing to really provide any information but this test should work with uniswap because we behave in different way and we shouldn't cover that because we run with mocks and mocks of course was created with the same bug so mocks was okay but real implementation total different and i definitely believe that fuzzing should found this Mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. When you are creating a mock, you are assuming how everything works, and if your assumption is not precise enough, it will, it will, it, you won't be able to detect something. And we, as an auditors, it's, 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 it's common that we have to audit contracts that will interact with other other contract. Let's say compound. So when we go into compound, we have all the documentation and says, well, compound work like this or like that. When we look at the code and see some things that are not documented, and we go back into the developers and look, look if your if your contract is doing this or that, it will revert, and you're not testing for that. So it's when you when you are using a third party uh, contract, you are importing the risk. So either either you have really good test, or you even uh, make sure that you understand everything. Otherwise, it will be difficult to catch the uh, the bug. But yeah, I, I think this type of bug can be found with fuzzing. Like the most, like the difficulty is going to find an initialization that makes sense and an invariant that makes sense. Um, that's why that's why you know we are kind of in putting like the emphasis onto defining invariant because this is like the key component of this technique. Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of speed, is it okay to put all deployment script into constructor? Because of course, if you deploy a, such a huge system and you deploy some contracts from external repositories like Uniswap and so on, it requires time. And of course, when you want to test million operation, if you redeploy each time, whole the system, it could require hours or days. I know. Yeah. So, so, so when you use Echidna, you deploy it only once. And then the, when your test finish, it will go back to the state after the contract is deployed. There's no need to redeploy it. And that is why we have, we, we ask the developer to have fixed amount of parameters in the deployment, right, on the, on the, on the constructor. Otherwise, we, we will know what, what we should deploy. Yeah, I think there is a question over there, so. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering, as you, uh, once you've, kind of define your invariance. Um, and I imagine you guys in your audits, you, you run through these and um, basically I'm at trying to understand when you guys have confidence that yes, the this is a good invariance uh, from, and, and if there are any metrics that you guys use uh, internally, like I see it's outputting unique instructions and unique code hashes, those sorts of things that uh, give you confidence in, in what you've done. So in, in practice, you know, you can look at the coverage, but usually coverage is not a good indicator. And in fairness, like, you know, when we do that, we do this in a time box manner. So we have two or three weeks to do it, and we're going to do our best in two or three weeks. Um, 
that's the best that we can do. Yeah, it's 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 tough. We there is no there is no like uh, silver bullet for this. Yeah. Uh, it, it we when we do a report, we list the invariants that we test. So it's it's clear what what we tested and what and everything else was was not tested with tools. So we, we perhaps did manual review or use other techniques like Slitter to check some some other things. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, there is no uh, good way to to define this. Uh, but perhaps I I personally think that talking with the developer early on the invariants, it's a really good thing. It's usually the case that. We think an invariant, let's say, that some some value cannot be zero, and we go into the, the into the, the uh, client and says, is, "Is this an invariant?" We don't know because we have not designed the system, and they don't know. And if they don't know, that that's an issue, right? We we should we should absolutely know what is the behavior of the system, and and if we don't know if an invariant should should if something should be an invariant or not, then we should go back and re rediscuss that. And yeah, security in general is not binary. It's not, you know, yes or no. Uh, it's really a matter of how much resource you want to put into it. And more resource you put, more confidence you will have. Thanks. I have a question actually more related to the earlier question, which is a big uh, class of bugs that's been occurring recently and for a while now are reentrancy bugs, right? How do you deal with finding um, violations of invariants that correspond to external contracts in that way? Okay, so this is a really good question. And in my opinion, the best tool to find reentrancy is static analysis. So the question is more to find which technique you should apply for which problem. And for things like reentrancy, Slater and static analysis is just going to be better. You can use further, you can create like reentrant callback and things like that. But in practice, static analysis is just going to outperform any further at this work. Uh, that's why like for any any class of vulnerability, which is kind of a pattern based, you can use static analysis and it's going to be better in my opinion. And uh, one more question, what's your addition? For example, we have a complex system and we want to make a classical fuzzing with echidna. And it seems that to really cover many cases, it requires a lot of computational power. So maybe can you advise some cloud provider how to do to run it maybe for a week with very powerful computer to get something achievable? Because of course, these pretty simple contracts could be found on my MacBook. But if you go a little bit further, many contracts, many setups, maybe it requires more computational power. Um, so, Gustavo, do you want to talk about Echidna Parade? So the question was, um, if you want to run Echidna on the cloud or on a lot of, you know, on a, a, a large like system, how can you do it? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the first thing that uh, you should know is that uh, uh, it can, it, if you have a very large contract, it can take some amount of memory. So. First, first thing, get a good server with with a good amount of, of memory and CPUs. Um, so the second thing is uh, every um, we have a Python companion tool called Echidna Parade that will run Echidna in any number of uh, any number of, of uh, um, uh, concurrent um, uh, instances. So you can run ten at a time. Uh, but we are not only going to run it 10 at a time, but we are going to randomly shuffle parameters because in some cases there are some, there are some issues that can be easily found with let's say three or 10 transactions. And some other uh, issues are going to be more easily found with two, 200 transactions in a, in, a, in a row, right? So what we do is we run the tool in different with different random parameters and in different let's say generations so we run we run echidna for an hour 10 times then we save the corpus and you can get you you can see all the all the all the code that was covered and then we start again but taking the 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 output of the previous generation so you iterate over and over again so you can see how your code is explored 
right? Or if there's some part of the code that is not explored with 10 different uh, instances, you can go back and say, no, I need, I need to change this because it doesn't depend on the, on the actual execution. So we can we can uh, give you the link uh, for that. It's it's just a Python tool, so it's 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 easy to use. Um, yeah, it's also open source. Like everything we are doing is open source. Okay, so yeah, like it's really about spending time and thinking about our invariants. And start simple. Like if the first invariant that you are writing leads to a bugs, there is something wrong about your approach. Uh, you should not have like simple invariants that you know are going to work the system. So we start simple and iterate over them. Okay, to give you some example, let's say you have an arithmetic library. What invariant can you have? Um, you can have commutative properties. A plus B is equal to B plus A. You can have identity. A, uh, one multiplied by two should be uh, true. Or inverse, if you add something by its opposite, it should be zero. This is not always true, right? But depending on what you are building, this might be like the type of property you are looking for. For token, we already talked about the first one. No, no user should have a balance above total supply. Let's say you want to look at the transfer function. And let's think, transfer function, what does it do? I'm transferring token to someone. So at the end, uh, my balance should have decreased by the amount, and the receiver should have seen uh, its balance increase by the amount. And let's say you try to write something like that. What you might quickly realize is that what happens if the destination is uh, myself. So if I transfer token to myself, my balance is not going to increase or decrease, right, hopefully. So this is an example where you might try to define an invariant on transfer, it might seem simple. You might write like the, the thing in solidity. And if you do that, the is going to tell you that there is an edge case where if you transfer to yourself, uh, like the invariant is going to be, to be broken. And in this example, if you go through this, um, it's not the code which is bad, it's the invariant that was bad. So that's why having this iterative approach uh, is really important because sometimes you are going to make assumptions about your system and you might actually be wrong. And as the system gain in complexity, it's more and more likely that it's going to be more difficult to refine the invariant. Something else which is also important to, to consider is um, returning false or uh, reverting. For example, an invariant you can have is that if you don't have enough funds, the transfer function should either revert or uh, return false, depending on, on how you implemented the token. Once you have this list of invariants, usually you can split invariant into two categories. Function level invariant, system level invariant. Function level invariant are usually stateless. There are things that you can just you know, look at a specific function and try to see if it holds. So arithmetic you know, invariants I mentioned are stateless and are function level invariants. Here you can craft simple scenario just by calling the specific function. Then you have system level invariants. System level invariants are usually more complex, uh, but they are also more powerful. And here you are stateful. You are going to change uh, the state of the contract and you are going to try to see if the invariant hold no matter the state. And here it's why it's important that Echina is calling all the different functions because it's actually what you want to try. The balance uh, being below or equal to the total supply is an example of uh, a system level invariant. For function level invariants, one thing that you can use um, is a different mode on Echina instead of calling Echina underscore something. Uh, we support assertion. So you can just create function, put assertion, and try to see if it holds. For, sim for system level invariant, as we, we kind of already like discussed, it might be more complex depending on the initialization of your system. Uh, if it's a simple initialization, you might be able to do everything in the constructor. If the constructor is too large for like the bytecode size or for whatever reason, uh, you might have to split it, and here it's where you can use a kid now. Uh, it, you know, sorry. Okay, yeah. All right, so let's let's see this uh, particular piece of code. Let's take um, uh, half a minute to read it. Um, it's it's basically a by function that will uh, call an internal function valid by. Uh, so what we are going to do is we're going to think uh, what are the type of invariants that we can have here and what, what, each, what will they are going to test and what type of guarantees we're going to get from this. 
So let's let's take a few few seconds for this. Ah, yes. So we have a question. Okay. So the question is uh, uh, testing timestamp dependent. So it, clearly not not the case here for timestamp depending code. Uh, um, Echidna, when it runs, it automatically increase either the block number or the block timestamp inside some range, right? Because it, it happens that some code will fail uh, when the timestamp is increased into a really, really large number. But yeah, 100 years or, or like the, the end of the universe. So we don't care if, if the smart contract has a, a bug that can, can only be triggered in the end of the universe it will be the least of our problems. Um, all right, so yeah, any, any idea what are the type of things that we can test here? Yes. The first one, we can understand that how much token, how many tokens we can get as a result follow the, our expectation when we're sending message value because as i can see it's a hard-coded rate is around 10 so basically it's a pretty simple formula we can change different value we put into the function we have totally prediction how much we can get and then we can try to verify that it works Yes, exactly. So the the uh, the property is related with the amount that we can get, even the number of uh, weight that is sent. So um, yeah, uh, we can. So the first thing is this this code will depend on the state. Uh, we don't have the mint function, so we don't know what is what is inside. However, we have the valid by function that is actually abstracting the thing that we want to that we want to test. So we will start with valid by, which is a pure stateless function. Um, yes, so we were thinking about invariance here related with um, the amount that we can get. So this is, this is a very simple, without going into specific, uh, this is a very simple invariant. If the amount, if the waste is zero, then the user, should receive no tokens at all, right? So, so that's, it's, it's even simpler than thinking how, how much a user should receive, but it's a concrete case and it's, it's, it's kind of a corner case, so it's, it can be important to test. All right, so how we can test this? So there, there are a couple of ways to test it. This is, um, this is one. So we, we can write a function that will take uh, one parameter, so I can we'll put any any number there. However, we're going to restrict the number, uh, the input of this function to be non-zero. Uh, then we're going to execute valid by, um, and then it, uh, we want to know if Akina can reach can reach the, um, the the statement after that, because valid by will revert if if the um, uh, if the inputs are not uh, the one expected, um, so we want to know if we can get if we can get tokens despite sending no um, no value, right? And so perhaps you're wondering what if what if uh, this amount is zero? Uh, then clearly this code will not do anything interesting which was just is going to revert. Uh, when you're writing tests, you need to, so you can put any, any amount of requires or preconditions, how people usually call it. However, if you put, uh, if the preconditions are too restrictive and your, uh, your function reverts most of the time, it means like you're not going to get value from the execution. So every execution reverted in a test in an invariant, let's say that every every case that you don't uh, that you don't use, it's going to be uh, an execute an, an execution that you waste. So in this case, you only waste one one execution in a range of in the full range of uh, units, two hundred fifty six. So it's not a big deal. 
But if you have, if you put a lot of requires that only a very small, small amount of uh, values will satisfy, it, and it will be difficult to get randomly or even even with the with the techniques that we use, you will need a slightly different ap approach. But yeah, we will we will uh, then go later into that. So any any questions? Yes. Yeah, so as you mentioned uh, in this case that we are basically sacrificing only one uh, one case, which is when it's zero. Uh, but is it going to run over the whole range of UN-256? Because that's a really large range and, and it doesn't make sense to test all of that in some cases. Yeah, exactly. So it won't, it won't, there, there will, there is no tool in the world that can run for all the, all the range. Uh, it is always either either uh, symbolic I mean you can do it symbolically but it's, it's, it's not it's not going to test all the values it's, it's, it's another thing um, and uh, fasting techniques are going to sample let's say randomly from the from the input or with helps right um, it's uh, in the case of echidna since we are going to compile this code and it will run through our static analyzer we will detect some interesting values. In this case, um, ten, for instance, ten, 10 is an interesting value. There, it's a it's a constant, and it's going to be used somewhere. So definitely, we want to we want to test with that constant. Okay, so let's see what happens if we if you if you run. So this is uh, uh, so Akina will run a number of transactions. It will eventually detect that a certain no free token has an assertion failure. However, this is going to be in the context of a hundred of transactions, random transactions that perhaps will do something that is completely unrelated. But what we'll do is input minimization. Input minimization is a very old technique referred to testing in which you have uh, a list of bytes that affects uh, a bug. You want to remove that bytes um, uh, one by one or in some random way in order to get uh, um, uh, a list of bytes that will still trigger the bug, but it's going to be minimal or or either a local or a global minimal, depending on the type of tool that you that yours. So in this case, uh, we can uh, Echidna will try to minimize any any uh, parameter. Here we have only one parameter, and the parameter is actually is actually going to be useful triggering the bug. If we have more parameters, they are going to be minimized towards zero. So if you have uints, uh, then it will be reduced until zero. So zero is the simplest um, uh, value. This is arbitrary to find on the uh, on the code. You can you, you can change it if you want. And but in this case, the parameter cannot be zero because if it's zero, the the test will pass, right? So in this case, the minimal amount is, is one. It's not guaranteed that you will always get the smallest um, set list of transactions to trigger. Uh, this is an, uh, uh, an MP complete problem. It cannot be solved on, on, on linear time. So it's, it's all going to be always a, a sample. But in, in, in practice, uh, even randomly sampling, removing transactions, or reducing the complexity of each uh, value will, will give you good answers. All right. So, a little bit about Echidna APIs. Wait, wait, yeah, maybe, sorry. maybe we can yeah. just explain. Um, yeah. yeah. Just explain why it's happening. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, the issue here is that if you send one desired token, what's going to happen is that you do one divide by ten, and one divide by ten is zero, uh, because you are winding down, and as a result. Uh, the required amount to be sent is zero. So if you ask any number of tokens below 10, you are going to get them for free. And this is, okay, again, an example where we define an invariant. We don't actually look at the formula. We are not looking at how this formula works. We just define an invariant that if you don't send ether, you should receive no token. And by doing that, Echina can find you know, arithmetic issue. And we're actually heavily using Echina for bonding for you know uh, mistaking the formula and and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, just... I get that this function is for testing purposes, but um, in a real situation, where sent is not part of the 
of the signature of the function, right? You read that from the message. Yeah, yeah, Mes yeah, yeah. This could be like like deeper into the code, right? Right. So, how do you do in that case? You read that into the asserting function. How you do that? So yeah. So this, uh, uh, if I understand it correctly, so this this Wait. could be an internal part, and you can have like a lot of code that put like gets the value from the from the message value and right. then do something else. Ah, uh, you can do that. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, is, this depends on on your code. Here we are we are testing an internal function, right? Using oh, using right. some some defined. Yeah, and if if it was using message dot value, uh, I can I can also find yeah, message dot yeah yeah exactly. So uh, yeah, so uh, properties can also take value. So and if you have a constant in your code saying message value should be uh, 42, 42, 42, it will use that constant eventually. So you should be able to hit that particular that particular case, uh, given the fact that this is random sampling, of course. But can you, uh, moving back to the previous slide, to the function, sure. what I'm really wondering, because we talk about this error, whoever token slash 10 is, uh, so way less than, it's so small amount, and the same problem which could be here, it's overflow if I provide a huge amount of ease because we have a multiplication to decimals, it could be done. On the other side, we all of us know that the quantity of S is limited. You can't even take a flash loan and get more ease than it mm -hmm. produced. So what is the best practice? Follow this formal execution when you write fuzzing test or take some real examples as uh, limitations that there is no much as uh, zero as it exists at the moment and we know it's a deflation so we can simply assume that in the future nobody could take so much to get overflow here yeah yeah exactly so yeah this is is an interesting question and it goes into the fact that what are your assumptions on the test right if you if your assumptions are like i have this token with this limited supply that should never go over something then you you can just say i require that the uh, that the value sent cannot be more than the total supply of something right and but in the case of iter is a little bit more tricky and and in fact in 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 echidna what we do is we have we have externally owned accounts that are simulated. We load it with ether every at every transaction, because you can have a very large amount of ether. You can take a flash loan. Uh, you you probably cannot have as uh, enough ether to overflow uh, you into two hundred fifty six because that will be a real issue for the AVM uh, in in itself. But um, we can we can define in the Echidna config which is the maximum amount of value that we send per transaction, right? So if you put like I don't care if the attacker has more than than ten thousand ether because that will mean like they can do other things, then Echidna will happily uh, take that limit and will never put something more. However, it's still the case that over several uh, number of transactions, the accumulated number of feature can go over that, that barrier. So you should, you should be careful with and, that. And uh, there is also an approach that you can take here. So basically, you are building an invariant, and the invariant has a threshold, so has like a value. A, a question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so power. either you start where the invariant has really limited threshold, like really restrained one, and you try to see if it holds. If it's working with like, a, you know, like you, with one eater, Okay, it's already working, so you can continue like this. If it's not working, then you can increase the threshold time, from time to time. Or you can take the opposite approach. You define an invariant where uh, the threshold is really large, it's breaking because it's really large, and then you decrease the threshold. So either you start really limited, and you know, depending on the result, you remove the limitation, or you start without limitation, and you reduce for, uh, like yeah. up, up to the point where you have a, kind of like a, a value for which you feel comfortable with. Yeah, yeah, and, and that is also related with the fact that do we want to have false positives or false negatives? What is the risk? If we start with very large values, we, we could have false positives, but... And if we start with very small values, we can have a false negative. But which are the ones that are going to cause you more trouble? That is something to, to think about it, because if you miss one false positive, your, your protocol can be 
you know, destroyed. And if you miss one one false negative, then it could be okay. All right. Hey there. In terms of fuzzing mutation, uh, do you do any clever things like? Uh, say this function has a constant of 10. So would you then uh, see the constants in the, the function and use yeah. that as input? Yeah, we, we will use the constant from the function and we will fuzz our one the constant also. Like if you see 10, we are going to use 10, we are going to use 9, 11, uh, you know, like uh, our one. Uh, yes, there are some, there are some uh, techniques. I can show you a little bit uh, after a few lines of the code of Echidna that shows all the mutations. We have mutation, interesting mutations on list of transactions in which we shuffle. We do, uh, we do like um, uh, a splice as well. So we take uh, a list, a list of interesting transaction and another one and we splice it in a random position. So there are, there are a couple of fun things to, to look at, but uh, yeah, I think we should move on a little bit. Um, all right. So as I was saying, we have this uh, failing. Even if you don't understand what was, what is the failure, um, well, that is that is a different that is a different beast. Sometimes you 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 have you put your your um, your invariant and your invariant fails, and then you start the journey to understand why it fails. So that's we are not going to talk about that. You uh, some people like to re uh, rerun, rerun the failure into a unit test to make sure step by step what is what is going on. But yeah, that's that's a completely different uh, type of beast that is related with what happened after and how we can fix how we can fix the issue. All right. So a little bit about Echidna APIs. This is um, a topic that um, it's uh, it's it's still uh, an open debate in some in some cases. So, what are the best way to test to create properties? So, Echidna supports a couple of different ones. It supports Boolean properties in which a function uh, is executed, um, and then it will should it should return uh, a Boolean true or false. And if the function reverts for any reason, that is the same as returning false. Right, so if we go back a little bit, we can see over there error and recognize opcode that is going uh, that is related with the assertion failure. This that is how um, uh, old version of Solidity used to uh, uh, have um, these uh, uh, assertion failures. But if you use Boolean, it will just say return false, right? So you know exactly how uh, how the property failed. Uh, or it could be a revert. So you you, you say over there, uh, you see over there, it revert. Okay. So either you do Boolean properties, which are the classic way to define invariants, and these come from uh, uh, some some very old techniques. Uh, in particular, Quick Check, which is which is a, a property based testing tool for Haskell and a couple of other languages, uh, which was an inspiration for 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 this. Then you have assertion failure. So every time you see, uh, uh, every time uh, the the assertion is called with false, that is uh, that will fail. However, if in the context of your function you see a revert, that will not make the function uh, the property fail. Here we can see that if valid by reverts, then the this uh, I cannot will not report that because we are using assertion mode. So you you should be careful if you are using if you if you care about reverts, uh, you should have to uh, either use the um, the type of um, um, the boolean type, or what you can do is if you care about reverts in valid boy and if it's an external function, you can do a try and catch and you can check which type of revert and you can even fail in, in some type of reverts and not in other because you want the user to get a good message of, of revert and perhaps other type of reverts you don't you you want to know so uh, and finally we have the dap and foundry a api in which um you will uh you will have um a function that if it reverts uh it's going to it's going to fail and otherwise it's not, and I hope the Foundry team <laughs> agree with us, and it's uh, 
this is correctly implemented. Um, all right, so there is testing modes um, in the um, in the um, in our repository, so we can um, uh, you can go there and it's it explain a little bit more. This is very high level overview. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 yeah. Uh, Echidna is something return bool, a boolean. Uh, it's easy to define. Uh, no side effects. That 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 is so interesting. When you use boolean properties, all the side effects will be reverted. Uh, before the execution of the actual invariant, right? But if you're using assert, the side effects, so everything you change in the blockchain will will remain. So this can be really useful for testing some some complex code. But yeah, we're not going to. We, um, yeah, assertion is can be simple to to um, um, define. Um, and it's, it's, it will also um, it will also be easy to see on the code coverage if it's not if it's not covered or or not. However, some code, especially some old piece of Solidity code, it's going to have assertion as required, and that is a really bad thing. You should not be doing it. Use require if you want to if you want to actually um, uh, have a precondition in your code and use assertion for for testing. Okay. Um, yeah. And finally, we have the the Foundry and DAP uh, compatibility. The only thing, well, uh, the thing that we don't support is pranks. So we don't like to prank people. So <laughs> we don't we don't support pranks. However, we support some of the some of the um, uh, HAVM. Yeah, the HAVM, the original ones, uh, cheat codes. You should be careful using it. Uh, we uh, we know that there are some uh, catch with that, especially related uh, with what the Solidity compiler expects and what you are doing in your in your transaction. So please be careful because you could have some uh, um, some some issues. So we in we rarely use cheat codes. Uh, we try to keep all are called as close as the Solidity possible. So you can easily port it to another tool. There's there's little Echidna specific. Uh, but yeah, we are also open to discussion if if the community agrees that we need a specific cheat code or we need to avoid some specific cheat code, then we are open to, to this code. All right. Um, so exercise four, we're going to deal with uh, um, one of the um, one of the um, uh, exercise for uh, dumb vulnerable DeFi. So, how many of you know this uh, um, amazing uh, CTF? Um, ah, yeah. Sorry, you you. But yeah, we can skip it. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, we can skip it. This is the. So this exercise was exactly the same as the first one, but instead of using function uh, Echidna and Dothka, uh, we were using assertion. Yeah. So it's exactly the same invariant, exactly the same setup. But with a different API, just as an example. Yeah, so we will go into a more interesting example. Um, but before that, um, there is uh, something that you will need, which is called the multi-ABI mode. Um, so usually, usually testing tools take a specific contract as your main contract to interact. So in in, in the default mode, Echidna will only target a specific contract that you can put in on, on your command line, or if you have only one contract, you will use uh, the first one, right? But there is something called multi-ABI that would call every, every contract that is deployed after the constructor that you have ABI, right? So if you deploy something in bike in Bico directly and you don't have ABI, Kidna won't be able to call it because it doesn't know what is what is there. But if you if you deploy a couple of tokens and several contracts and you use multi ABI, Echidna will call any function in any deploy contract uh, after after the, the the end of the constructor. So we will need this in order to deal with the next example. Because sometimes the 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 bug that you want to detect, it doesn't depend on the state of one contract. It depends on the state of many contracts. And in that case you can you can be surprised by the fact that changing the state in another contract can break your your, your property, and definitely we want to avoid that. Okay, so uh, again, how many of you know about them vulnerable DeFi? 
Okay, a yeah, good number. And did you actually? Well, this is, these are the first exercise, the first the first two. Uh, so I hope that uh, um, people know. So if you know this this how to solve it, you should. Uh, it's going to be even easier uh, for you. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, take a look of this um, sample. So yeah, I assume that we already you already have the code. So um, it's the um, exercise, the, the naive receiver one. Um, so what we want to do is we want to be able to drain um, the, the funds in flash loan receiver, right? Yeah, ju just to give like a, a bit of a description of the, of the challenge, um, here you have two contract. You have the naive um, receiver lender pool, which ah. basically... Yeah, can you yeah, go? yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's over there. Yeah. Um, I can allow you to take a flash loan for a fee. And you have a second contract, uh, which is a user uh, contract that is going to interact with the uh, pool. And the contract is going to be, the user contract is going to be deployed with some funds inside. And the goal is going to try to see if it's possible for this specific contract from the user to be drained. Exactly. So, what uh, what we want you to do is um, uh, we we want you to review the the um, the exercise. If you have already did it, it it requires you to send some 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 number of transactions. So in this case, we are going to prepare everything for Echidna to rediscover this without uh, telling it what is what uh, how how it can be. Uh, uh, so, so we will need two things. We will need to initialize the um, um, the code to have um, to match what the um, what the initialization is is um, is actually showing us. Let's see. Okay, so this is the the flash loan, uh, the part of the of the flash loan. So uh, the the interesting part about this is we don't have to care about specific details in the code. We want to. We want to um, give Echidna the same scenario that we have on the on the actual uh, challenge, and we want to know if it can actually find a way to drain the contract. So yeah, we can uh, we can see uh, how the receive iter function um, works here. But um, yeah, the the interesting part perhaps is the initialization. What we are going to do is we are going to Deploying the constructor of our um, test, we're going to deploy the the contracts that we have here and prepare everything, and then we're going to use a suitable um, uh, invariant, which should be really simple. You don't have to uh, overthink, and we want you to uh, run a kidna uh, with that in order to see if it can drain the contract uh, with, a, of course, with a suitable. Um, uh, with this double invariant. So yeah, we will take... Um, 10 minutes, I think. Yeah. We are running out of time. Yeah, we are running out of time, but uh, let's take 10 minutes. So the first step is really like, this is a initialization from the test case of the contract. The first step is really just to replay this into a Solidity constructor and then to write the invariant. Yeah, so happy to take questions or any technical issues. That's, that's the goal, actually. Uh, we are going to do exactly what he's doing here, but in Solidity. Yes, there uh, there is an alternative way to do it, but the Solidity approach is is easier to to avoid um, because well, the other tool is called Itino that can replay this in a simulated blockchain like an Ash and then send it to the to the tool. So uh, in that case, you don't need to replay it on Solidity manually but you are still are still know still need to know where is everything deployed right so if you want to interact with the pool you need to know where is where is, which is the address of the pool and you can you can then uh, uh echidna cannot actually call the poll functions uh, automatically because it, it has everything but in this case we're going to go into simple root uh that is going to uh take us to uh, rewrite it's just a couple of and this kind of match what we are doing in an audit. We might look at the existing unit test to understand initialization, and we might translate them in solidity if needed uh, to then create the invariants. So, 
So yeah, the, the, the previous exercises are on the easy side. This is a little bit more difficult, but still shouldn't require more than a few lines. Um, so yeah, but please let us know if you if you need some some hints. There are some hints in the um, in one of the um, one of the branches in the hint branch. But yeah. Hey there. Uh, hello. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, is there any thought or uh, current support for mainnet forking or, or um, state forking of some sort? Not yet. Yes, so uh, not yet. HAVM has support for that, but that will that will need us to put um, that requires to do like input output on on transactions. So we need to check if that will impact on the actual um, on the actual um, performance on the code. Um, so yeah, they will. Um, yeah, um, I have kind of high level question so I'm, I'm trying to think about what the limitations are in terms of expressing properties as invariants right so for example let's say we have a temporal property that we want to express like we have a wallet contract and we want to be able to say that any user who deposits their money is eventually able to withdraw it is that just like a fundamental limitation of echidna or is there a way to so kind of if you handle that? if you can so the notion of eventually it's you you need to have some definition on the on, on the blockchain right so eventually cannot mean like in a hundred years right so if you if you define say a will only allow increment of time up to some limit yes you can you can call it as a bounded version of that property but you cannot you cannot use it as a, a theoretical thing like you know I have a state which I don't know what it is and then I will transition to another state which I don't know which, which, uh, uh, what it is and in that case you will need to know if the original state was actually possible and and things like that so the uh, echidna works on a, on a concrete on on concrete states. So you always have con uh, concrete state, and you need to put like boundaries on the things that you that you can do. So if you say uh, a user should r eventually uh, receive this amount, and eventually means like in a number of transactions and a number of blocks or timestamp, then yes. Otherwise, it's it's more like a theoretical proof that you are doing, and you probably need another type of tool. Yeah, I guess. I'm curious, even if you took like the bounded case, because that's fair that you're dealing with like concrete traces here. It seems like that's not, or it's not intuitive to me anyway, how you would express that as like one of these invariants. So you you will you will do something like this. You will put uh, a function that says, uh, uh, and um, you will need a uh, a state to track down. Like uh, you you do a deposit. And you will need a user to eventually receive something, right? Mm -hmm. So you will need to have a state that tracks deposits, like a mapping, right? And you have a function that ha is your invariant. So if, um, uh, and then you receive the address of a user and you check in the mapping, uh, if, if the time um, between the last deposit is in this range, then you will going to check something. And if, if if the time in this in this other range, you're going to check some something else. So it will be like randomly checking in in transactions, um, and with that you will be able to cover, um, given the fact that you are going to generate enough transactions and enough time times, right? I see. So it seems like the answer is it's capable of doing it, but it requires some like kind of manual adjustment of the code almost to add state. So, that so yeah, you will you so if the if the property that you are testing requires to add state, yes, you will need to add whatever state is needed. It won't be able to track state outside, mm -hmm. right? The only thing that will be tracked outside is the increment between between the uh, different blocks, for instance. So that that will be tracked uh, outside, and Akina will show you from in between this transaction and this transaction, I have ten blocks. That will be tracked uh, outside, but everything else, if you need to do a mapping between users and, and the time between certain operation, you will need to keep that in a different, in, a, in, in solidity, in a, in a different variable. 
I see. Great. Thank you. All right. So we have some other questions. Hi. Um, is there any feature that allow me to guide the fuser over the domain of values that I want to try? Um, so in order to in order to guide the, the fuser into a particular state, the easiest way to do it is to add um, is is to add a, a small piece of code that will be auxiliary code in order to um, move the state from your contract into something else. Like for instance, if you have if you have a contract, uh, uh, the protocol that requires uh, a deposit with a particular uh, property, let's say that uh, you have three parameters and you need a deposit that has uh, that has these three parameter in 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 the same in the same number or or in numbers in which in which they are difficult to find. You can add this piece of code, but it's important to let Echidna to explore freely at the same time that you are adding information so it's it's actually important to know that as an auditor or as a developer you are adding information into into it, not just using it as a black box right so every state transition that is non-trivial to find or is really really important you sh you can add it and make sure that it can eventually execute it because it's going to be another another transaction to uh, to execute but at the same time you want to allow the tool to explore things that you don't expect. Because if you just restrict, says, I only expect users to do this type of deposits, then you can you can be surprised later because there, there is a way to break your, your property using things that you don't expect. Great, thanks. And it comes down to the, the previous question where either you start with a lot of requirement and a lot of you know, restriction in what you are trying to explore, and uh, if it holds, you are going to remove some of the restriction, or you start the opposite direction. You don't have any restriction, and you, know, you go uh, more and more restricted. Okay. So did did anyone manage to at least uh, still still um, start to uh, create the constructor or or even run it uh, to have some some invariant or even think about the the invariant that you need. So in in a couple of minutes we'll go over the conclusions and we'll show the the, the solution. Um, but yeah, happy to take any additional questions. Just from an implementation uh, side, I'm curious what um, what actual like virtual machine do you use to deploy and execute contracts? So we we use HAVM, uh, which is the virtual machine written in Haskell. I know that it's in the process of uh, improving and re rewriting, so it was moved from the 
adapt to into the Ethereum repository. So we are eager to test new features. <laughs> But yeah, um, if you use the Tino companion tool to deploy a contract, it's going to use Kanash, um, and it will serialize into a JSON file, and you can then load it into, into that. Okay. Do, do we go? In, yeah. Do, do we go into the into the uh, solution? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we're going to uh, quickly go over the solution uh, so we can have a couple of minutes for for this. So the solution requires first to uh, deploy have a contract with enough amount of ether uh, to to match what is deployed. Um, and then um, you can see here, uh, in we we deploy all the contracts that we need and send um, the amount of ether that uh, every contract needs. And then what is uh, what we're going to use? We're going to use a simple, very simple property that is going to say that the balance of the receiver is at least ten ether. So we don't actually need to follow exactly what the exercise says about draining completely the contract. If we have one transaction that allows you to reduce the balance of the receiver, then it, then then it's, then something is wrong, and uh, definitely uh, it will it will eventually be drained. So yeah. So quickly, if you run it, you will see something like this, um, in which well the uh, uh, the flash on has a has a parameter that is the the uh, the borrower, and we can control this to in order to. Um, reduce the amount of balance. All right. Uh, so yeah, you want to go into the conclusions? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We had a second exercise on demo noble DeFi, but uh, we are running out of time. The idea was the same. We are defining initialization, uh, which was a bit more complex. And if you go through this exercise with something a bit more specific, is that there is a callback from the contract to the caller. So in the Kino test, you need to have like also the callback to implement the, uh, the flash load. But yeah. OK. Um, yeah, so this is something we kind of touched on a bit during our discussion. What about the other tools? So there are a couple of other further out there. There is DAP, Brownie, Foundry. Uh, at least this one are open source. This file might be a bit uh, uh, better for simple tests and for like you know uh, ease of use for uh, like the first invariants because they are integrated within the compilation framework. But in the long run, they might not be as powerful as Echidna simply because we have you know uh, used Echidna for a couple of years and we have tuned it in a way that uh, it provides uh, the best value that we can do. Oh, it's, okay, it's finished. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed uh, the workshop. Um, we have more exercise in building secure contract. Something that I would recommend for you is to try to write invariant, you know, in your next project. And actually, who is going to try a key now on its next project? Nice. <laughs> and thank you. So today we're going to talk about storage proofs. I want to introduce this. Uh, Ah, yes. Uh, I'm going to present you storage proofs and explain why they're cool, how to work with them, why you need tooling to work with them, and yeah, a bunch of other things. Why is it even possible? All the complexities behind it, the trade offs, and so on. So, a few words about storage proofs. Why I really believe that they are cool, especially uh, nowadays. So, my thesis is that Ethereum is pretty sharded nowadays. And with storage truths, we can essentially read the state in an almost synchronous manner, which is a pretty, pretty nice thing to do, um, given the circumstances. Um, yeah, and maybe also let me explain why is it even possible. So storage truth is essentially this idea that the entire state is committed in a cryptographic manner um, using some data structure like Merkle trees, Merkle Patricia trees, and so on. 
Um, and yeah, we can essentially verify any specific piece of state at any point in time on any domain, which is pretty nice and doesn't introduce additional trust assumptions. You just rely on the security of like the base chain. Um, so yeah, that's like storage proofs TLDR where they are cool. Now a bit of like sponsored section of <laughs> sponsored section. So uh, what we're doing at Hervadotus. So our like goal is to make smart contracts self aware in a way. Uh, by providing access to historical state. Uh, we, like I said, my thesis is that Ethereum is pretty sharded nowadays. We want to unshard it by using storage proofs and we want to enable synchronous data reads because today we do not have really nice ways to make synchronous data access without introducing new state, uh, new trust assumptions. So yeah, that's what we do. And how we achieve that? We achieve that by using obviously storage proofs. We use NARCs, STARCs and MPC. Uh, I will get why we even use all this tooling, but first a few words about storage rules, what these are, and, and so on. <laughs> it's so tricky, actually. I, I need to be multitasking. Okay, so uh, what we're going to cover in today's workshop. So all the basics required to like understand properly this primitive, how to like work with it, uh, how we can generate these proofs, why they're pretty useful, and how actually you can access this commitments I'll get later what we call a commitment uh, in a trustless manner and how we make smart contracts self-aware and enable historical data reads. Cool. So um, oh, that's pretty uh, that's pretty tricky. So uh, about the background that I want you to have for this workshop. So we're gonna like start from the biggest basics. So what is a hashing function? Just a very quick reminder. I hope it will take less than a minute. Uh, like generalized blockchain anatomy, how an Ethereum header uh, looks like, why Ethereum are not like pretty on, only like Ethereum focused. Uh, however, I think that for the sake of this workshop, it's the best to like present on this concrete example. Miracle trees, explain me like on five. I will just quickly explain the idea how it works and what is a Merkle Patricia tree without really going too much into the details. Um, yeah, finally, no, not finally, uh, the anatomy of the Ethereum state. It's pretty important to like deal with this, uh, with this primitive and finally how to deal with the storage layout. Cool, so hashing function. Essentially is this idea. <laughs> Essentially, it's this idea that I can have a function that takes some input of any size and it will always, always return an output of a fixed size. And now what's also important, there is no input, there are no two inputs that will generate the same output and you cannot reverse uh, the hashing function. So it means that given the output, you don't know what is the input. And this is that what we call like collision resistance. Pretty useful primitive like used in blockchains. Uh, I will and I think that's, that's pretty much it. I assume that everyone is like familiar with it. Like, yeah. Okay. Why is it important? Um, so generalized blockchain anatomy. So why we call it a chain? Because we have a bunch of blocks bind together, like linked together, because each block contains the reference to the parent hash, and the previous header contains the reference to the parent hash, which is pretty cool. And let me remind what the hash. The, the parent hash or the block hash of uh, on Ethereum is, it's essentially the hash of the header. Uh, pretty important to deal with these primitives and make smart contracts self-aware, so accessing historical state. So uh, just keep that in mind. Let's get to the next part. So, um, no. Ah, I think I'm missing one slide. No, it's the correct one. Okay, so uh, this is an Ethereum block header. Uh, as I said, we're gonna go through the example of Ethereum concretely. So a bit of anatomy. So to access state, obviously we need the state root. What is the state root? Is the root of the Merkle Patricia tree of the Ethereum state. We also have the transactions root, which is pretty useful if you want to access historical transactions like their entire body um, and receipt root. So it's pretty useful to access and events, logs, and and so on. And all of these are like root of the Miracle Patricia tree. A Miracle Patricia tree is a Miracle tree, just think of it in that, in that way. And most importantly, we have the parent hash. And with the parent hash, we can, in a way, go, go backwards. 
I think that's it. Let's get to Merkle tree. So essentially it's this idea that I can take whatever amount of data and I can commit it in a cryptographic manner by using this data structure. So on the left side, we see a standard Merkle tree. So essentially all the data goes to the bottom and we essentially hash it. You know what the hashing function is, then we combine these two hashes together, we hash it and uh, we keep doing that till we get to essentially one hash and this is what we call the root. Merkle Petri shot tree, modified Merkle Petri shot tree to be exact. This is uh, the data structure that we use in Ethereum. Um, what you see here, I hope you see, on the top we have the state root, and essentially the state root is the root of this tree. And now how it works and how you should think of this, of this, it's a pretty complex data structure. I don't want you to bother with it today, but essentially we have three types of like nodes. We have leaf nodes, extension nodes, and branch nodes. So leaf nodes contain data, branch nodes contain data, and extension nodes, like on the high level, just help us to like sort of navigate in that tree. But to be honest, to deal with storage truths, you don't really need to understand this part, but to like build on the low level as we do, obviously we need to uh, we need to deal pretty uh, pretty a lot with that with that part. Okay, so Ethereum state, how is it constructed? Most important takeaway: it's a two-level structure. So I mentioned that the state root is a commitment of the entire state, but it's not really true because Ethereum is a does it slow? Okay, works. It's, uh, it's account-based, um, and essentially the state root is the commitment of all the accounts that exist on Ethereum, and what an account is made of, it's made of a balance, like the if balance, it's a nonce, transaction counter, storage root. The storage root is like the root of another Merkle Patricia tree, and this Merkle Patricia tree contains a key value database that holds like the mapping from storage key to its actual value. And finally, we have the code hash. It's essentially the hash of the, um, of the bytecode. So main takeaway, first, we access accounts. And once we have the account storage root, we can access its, its, its store. OK, um, cool. So to sum it up, uh, like the background, so main takeaways. Given the block state root, you can recreate any, any state for this specific block on this network. And given an initial trusted block hash, you can essentially recreate all the previous headers, which is pretty pretty cool and important to get the ideas that I will explain like pretty soon. Okay, so as it's gonna be a workshop, it's a short one, so I won't let you code, but I will show you some concrete examples. So what I want you to like go through with me today is how we can prove the ownership of a nice profile on another chain. So, a bit of background. Lens profiles are represented as NFTs, and Lens is deployed on Polygon. I think that's it. How do we get to this? So, first of all, the question that we need to answer to ourselves is, how does Polygon commit to Ethereum L1? Because if we want to, like, let's say, prove the ownership of a Lens profile on Optimism, we need to know the state root of Polygon but there is Ethereum L1 in the middle. So how do we actually access this on Ethereum L1 primarily? So uh, Polygon is a commitment, commit, commit chain, and it commits to, to Ethereum uh, a bunch of things every some amount of time. And essentially on L1, we do not validate the entire state transition, but we just verify the consensus of Polygon. And this checkpoints, how they call it, essentially contain uh, state routes and so on. I mean, not directly, but we can access them. And let's get to this to this part. So this is taken from Polygon's documentation. And this is how a checkpoint looks like. So as you can see, the checkpoint is made of a proposer. So who proposed the block? Start block, end block. Let, give me a second, I'll get to this. And most importantly, we have the root hash. So the root hash is essentially a Merkle tree, not a Merkle Patricia tree, that contains all the headers. And which headers? The headers in the range of start block and end block. Cool. So now, if we get back to the previous part, we can essentially prove with this commitment that we know the valid state root of Polygon. First, even block. 
Okay, a bit of hands-on. So we want to prove that I own a lens profile on Polygon forever. So, number one, we go to the contracts. We see a contract, we go through it, and we see that essentially there is a bunch of logic on top of this ERC721. This is like the basic ERC721. As you can see, it's an abstract contract, and it's slightly modified. Instead of having like a standard mapping from like token ID to its owner, we have like token ID to token data. Token data is a struct. This struct is 32 bytes in total. 20 bytes is the actual owner, and the remaining 12 bytes represent when the token was minted. Okay, but how do I actually prove it? Oh, and also, very important thing when dealing with storage layout, we have something that is called like slot indices. So each variable has a uh, given slot, like in the um, some sort of meta layout. I call it like that. It's probably the right way. Anyways, this mapping is, has like the slot index two. I will get to this part in a second why it's two. And we have a mapping from token ID. So you int to 32 bytes of data represented as a struct, but just think of it as some bytes. Okay. So uh, I guess most of you use Hardhat. So I'm going to present on, on Hardhat. There is a very, very cool tool to deal with storage layouts. It's called obviously Hardhat Storage Layout. This is how you install it. It's literally yarn install Hardhat Storage Layout. You add one comment to your Hardhat config. You write a new script that contains literally eight lines of code. You run the script and you get this weird table. And what does it what does it really tell you? And oh, and by the way, why this tool is pretty useful? As you see, this contract is abstract. So some other contracts in can does it still work? Yeah, some contracts can inherit from it. And obviously, while we inherit the storage layout, I mean this does this in synthesis can can get more trickier because it also Okay. So let's it's pretty hard to coordinate like one hand with another hand, even though I'm Italian. Okay, anyways. Um, yeah, we know this slot in the in this index, and that's how we get it. We have a column that is called storage slot. And as you see, underscore token data is marked as two, and that's it. Okay, but what do we do with it? How do we get this storage key? And yeah, that's that's it. Let me check the time. Okay. Um, so a bit of hands-on. How do we get the actual storage? It sounds scary and it's meant to be scary. So we know the slot index, the storage index. I want to prove that it's like 0x35 da, na, na, owns with ID 3594. How do we get the storage key? We essentially do this operation, so we concatenate the slot, I mean the key in the mapping, which is 3594 because this is the token ID. As you know, we have a mapping from token ID to token data. Token data contains the own. Okay, so we concatenate this with the storage uh, index. We hash it all together. This is the storage key that we have. Uh, if you're interested how to deal with it for like more complex mappings and like layouts, like the Solidity documentation, it's explained pretty well. So uh, now that's to make sure we got the proper storage key, let's just check it. How we can check it, super easy. Let's just make a one either PC call to get the storage at some specific key is the if get storage at. So the parameters. We want to access the storage of what? Of the lens hub. Lens hub is the contract that essentially is the representation of these profiles. And its address is 0x, d, 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 4, and so on. And the slot. Oh, is it better? Oh, it's much better. And the, slot, the, the storage key is 0x1. So essentially, that's the hash that we got. And the result is. 0x000, zero 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 zero, nah, nah, nah. and we know that it's 32 bytes of data where we have 20 and 12. So let's split it into 12 and 20 bytes. And what we have is some number, like you can see 0x, a lot of zeros, then 62 till D. 
And this looks like a small number, so apparently it is a timestamp. And the second part is like 35, 57, and it's literally our address. So we got it correct. We have the proper storage key. Cool. But how do we actually get to storage proofs? So there are standardized methods in like the JSON RPC standard for Ethereum clients. And this method is called ETH get proof, which essentially given the contract address, so um, better call it account address in this specific case, allows us to generate a state proof. And the last argument, I mean, the sorry, the second argument is an array that contains all these storage, um, storage keys that we want to prove. Uh, there is another argument, which is 0x1a. It's essentially the block number for which we prove the state. Um, yeah, let's call this method. Oh, by the way, uh, you might have a question, how do we deal with this method on non-EVM chains? Uh, because, for example, on some specific rollups, this method is like not supported. Actually, it's not a big deal. Because if you think of it, we just need the database. And on top of this database, we can literally build this, this method. We, we just need to know how the storage is constructed. OK, this is the proof. It looks scary. It is scary. This entire object is four kilobytes of data. And now I mentioned before that the state is like a two-level structure. First, we have a proof for the account itself. And then we have the proof for the storage, I mean, for the actual storage slot. It is scary. It's meant to be scary. One proof is like more or less 600 bytes. 700 bytes, it really depends, like bigger the storage is than bigger the proof is. And also more accounts we have than bigger the account proof is. So that's a lot of call data, if, um, if you can, ima can imagine. Uh, and yeah, that's that's pretty bad. Why? Because we need to post this proof on the chain. So it's a lot of call data. But okay, let's let's try. What's gonna be the cost on like an EVM chain? That's the cost. It's like 600k of gas. That's a lot. That kills almost every single application that you want to build on top of this nice primitive. So it's pretty bad. And why is it that bad? So I explained. On the high level, what Merkle trees are and Merkle Patricia trees are. On Ethereum, we use Merkle Patricia trees. And essentially, there is a trade off that when using Merkle Patricia trees, the proof is a slightly bigger. It's like harder to decode it because actually we need to do some a bit of decoding there. Um, but we need to do less hashing. So this is a trade off. But depending where we actually verify this proof, it might be more feasible to verify uh, like a proof that is based on Merkle Patricia trees or Merkle trees. OK, but there is a solution. And the solution is, what if we snarkify such, such a proof and we verify this proof inside the snark? Why is it cool? Because we can, like, let's say that I'm going to verify this proof inside the graph, graph 16 circuit. Um, and yeah, the verification costs more or less like 210k gas. The proof is like way less than 600 bytes. So it's good. So we essentially get rid of the cold data because the proof itself can be the private input to the circuit. Um, yeah, we can like use uh, multiple proving system depending on the on the actual use case. And now why is it like very, very cool? So first of all, it removes cold data. Second of all, it allows us to deal with very un unfriendly hashing functions for the EVM. These are the ones that we don't have pre-compiled for, like let's say Peterson. Um, so it might be like super expensive to verify such a proof on the EVM because first of all, that's a lot of call data and the hashing function is pretty like unfriendly. But what if we can like do it inside the snark and just verify a snark? And yeah, so another benefits, this really, really helps in abstracting the way how we verify these proofs because you don't need to have like one generalized verifier for each type of, of proof. But you can essentially abstract it behind behind the behind the snark, which is which is great. Uh, these numbers were taken from a very nice uh, article written by A16Z, like a bunch of uh, a few a few months ago. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much it. Let's get to the next slide. So, synchronous cross-layer state access. So, how can actually a contract deployed on some layer access the state of another L2 or L1? 
So I mentioned that we always need the state route, but because all of these systems have a native messaging system, we can send the small commitments like, for example, the block hash to like L1, usually it goes all through L1, and, and yeah, we can like unroll it or send the state route directly. And also we don't need to rely on messaging, but we can, for example, uh, rely on the fact that Polygon is like a commit chain and all these rollups like commit from time to time, they're like batches and, and so on. So this is like pretty important and we sort of can get the commitment from which we'll recreate the state directly on, on, on the one and then send it to another. Um, so if, let's say Polygon commits on L1, I can send this commitment then to StartNet and StartNet to do the actual verification. Cool. So now, how do we actually do that? So let's break the entire flow into like smallest pieces. So the flow is the following. We need to have access to the commitment, which is either a block hash or a state root. And again, we can get it or I, either by sending a message, relying on the fact that is this chain commit, so in a sense it's still a message, we can relate in an optimistic manner, or we can go even more crazy and verify the entire consensus. Okay, so this is step number one, we need to get the commitment. Step number two, we need to somehow access the state root, so the commitments of the state, from like a previous block or the actual block, because keep in mind that these commitments are only block hashes. And with block hashes we can recreate headers, but we, we cannot access the state. Okay, so once we have the state root, we obviously need to verify this state slash storage proofs. Okay, and there are multiple approaches to do that. All of them come with some trade-offs and let's go through all these approaches. So approach number one, messaging. So I can send a message from, let's say, optimism to Ethereum L1. I can get the opcode, I, I can get the block hash by just calling the proper opcode and and I get it. It takes some time, but still I get it. This is approach number one. So we rely on the built-in messaging system, which is I think fair because the security of it is equal to the security of the rollup. And if you are deploying an application of this rollup, it's a fair assumption to do so. Um, yeah, it doesn't Oh, the now about the downsides. So the message must be delivered, so it introduces a significant delay, especially when dealing with the withdrawal period in the in, in the middle. Uh, and it requires we it requires interacting with multiple layers. So first you need to send a message and then actually you need to consume it. So it's it's not ideal. But the trust assumptions are pretty okay. -ish. Another approach, consensus validation. By the way, this like Gremlin is supposed to verify a bunch of BLS signatures. I, I hope it's self-explanatory. Uh, okay, so maybe a few, uh, a bit of an intro. Um, right now we have POS as the native like consensus algorithm on Ethereum, which is pretty great because verifying the consensus is finally doable because before like verifying the hashing function ETH hash, which was used for proof of work was very memory intense. So not possible to do inside the snark um, on chain directly. So it was almost impossible to do so. Um, so now we also have this fork choice rule called LMD goes, which is implementable, but doing all of this like directly is pretty expensive. So we need to ideally wrap inside the snark, but there is another downside. So a few words about the trust assumptions. You, well, you verify the consensus directly. So it's, it's fine. He, do you introduce any trust assumptions? Not really, but the biggest downside that generating the proof actually takes some time. So to be honest, this approach is feasible, but comparing to messaging, like quite often is like almost the same and you pay a lot of improving time and requires like having more advanced infrastructure. Okay, last approach that we actually uh, use is something that we call like an optimistic relayer based on MPC. MPC stands for multi-party computation. Maybe before I <laughs> explain how it works, let me explain the, the image. I hope it's self-explanatory. So it's an MPC protocol. We have multiple parties. These multiple parties attest something. Then we have an observer 
that can challenge it. And then we have finally the commitment given to a specific chain, in this case, Starknet, once everything is fine. How does it work? So we have a set of trusted relayers, validators, however, and they attest that a specific commitment is valid. So how does it work? If we want to get the commitment, aka the block hash of block number X on Starknet, then instead of sending a message that would be delayed with a like slightly delayed, we can essentially make an off-chain call, just get the latest one and essentially relay this message directly to Starknet. But it comes with a few downsides because while well, we introduce some trust assumptions, uh, but still it's okay. Okay, how does it work? So it works in a way that we have a bunch of off-chain actors who essentially make these calls and it works more or less like a multi-seek but the reason why we have MPC is because more validators you have, then obviously more securities. But more validators you have in a like standard multi-sig approach, you have more signatures. So more in a way decentralized it is, then it's more expensive to verify because you need to verify multiple signatures and you need to like pause the signatures. It's a lot of call data. Such approach is not feasible on chains where call data is expensive. So L1, optimistic rollups, and yeah. Okay, so how does it work? Uh, what is the actually MPC part doing? The MPC part is very simple. It's essentially signing over like a specific curve, some specific payload, and the payload is the commitment itself. And that's it, okay. So this is how we actually attest, but now how, why this op approach is called optimistic and why it's still secure. So first of all, we just posted some something on the actual L2, and as you may know, we can send messages from L1 to L2. And such a message can contain like the proper commitment. So essentially, even if the validator set will lie, L1 will never lie. So you can just challenge such a message. And now, to participate in verifying these validators, it's super easy because it's literally two RPC calls. One call is gonna check the actual commitment on the actual chain, and the other one checks like what is the claimed commitment. If you disagree, you just send a message, it costs roughly 60K of gas, and that's it. Everyone can do that. Um, and again, the fraud proving window is pretty short because uh, it's essentially how long it will take to generate like the proof of consensus, if it's possible, or how long does it take to deliver the message. And what is pretty cool in this approach, it's not gas intensive, and uh, we verify just one signature. So that's about this approach. Let's make a recap and let's identify the trade-offs. So we have three approaches. The first one is messaging. The second one is validating the consensus, and the third one is having this optimistic layer. So I categorize it in four categories. The first one is latency. The second one is the gas cost. The third one is trust. And the last one is what is the off-chain computation overhead? Why do I even list it? Because if we do some sort of proving, then obviously it takes time because we need to generate the proof. So messaging, in terms of latency, we are quite sad because, well, the message needs to get delivered. So once the message gets delivered to some specific L2, L1 will be able to generate already new blocks. So we don't have like access to the newest values. In terms of gas cost, it's not bad, but it's not perfect because we need to interact with two chains at the same time. So first we need to send the message and consume it. In terms of trust, we are pretty happy because we trust the rollup itself, and that's a fair assumption. Off-chain computation overhead, we're very happy because there is no computation to, to do off-chain. Verifying the consensus. So in terms of latency, we are sad because we need to generate the proof. But we've done it, it takes a bit of time. In terms of gas cost, we are, I would say, sad because we need to verify the actual ZK proof, which is way more expensive than just consuming a message or verifying a signature. In terms of trust, we are happy because we verify the consensus itself. And computation overhead, it's significant, right? Because we need to generate the proof. Final approach, this optimistic relayer. So in terms of latency, we are happy because we simply make a claim and we post it on the other chain, that's it. Gas cost, we're very happy because the, well, we just verify a signature. 
in terms of trust, well, we are not that happy, but also not that sad at the same time, because it still can be challenged in an optimistic manner using a fraud proof. Um, computation, off-chain computation overhead, we're pretty happy because we participate like an MPC protocol. So essentially the overhead comes mostly from communication, not computation itself. Cool. So this is part number one. These are the three approaches. Obviously, I'm not going to say which one is the best because all of them come with some trade-offs. Um, okay. Accessing the headers. I hope it's self-explanatory because we literally unroll something from the trusted input. And the trusted input is, again, a block hash for a specific block X. And if you follow the initial slides, that's essentially each block. We, given a block hash, you can recreate the block header. And knowing the block header, we can access the parent hash. And by knowing the parent hash, you can recreate the previous block header to essentially go till, till the genesis block. So given this very small input, we can essentially unroll the state or whatever was present on the chain from this block till the genesis block. OK, so as I said, I'm going to explain everything on, on the example of Ethereum. And today, all the block headers together are like roughly 7 gigabytes of data. So it's quite a lot. But OK, this is how we actually do that. This is the high level concept. And what are the approaches? So the first one, we call it like on-chain accumulation. So essentially, we do this procedure, this computation directly on the chain. So we provide all these properly encoded block headers inside the call data and the block hash that we might receive as like the trusted input by sending a message, relaying it in an optimistic manner or validating the consensus. And yeah, like recursively go through all these headers and, and verify them. But there are many, many downsides because first of all, it's very call data intensive. It's very computational intensive. And now we can store all these headers on the actual chain, but you know, even storing on an L2, storing seven gigabytes of data is still a significant cost because the state on an L2 is reflected as call data on L1. So it's still expensive either way. But the cool thing is that I have direct access to, to like state rules or anything that I want to access. Next approach is on-chain compression. So we can still use the same approach as previously. So literally unroll it and process the seven gigabytes of data. But instead of like storing them, we can just update the Merkle tree. It's a nice approach, but comes again with a few downsides. It's very computationally intense because if we have like millions of headers, we need to perform millions of hashes on the chain. That's that's expensive, but at least we, we save on, on storing data. Um, and also we need to update the Merkle tree, which is, which is another cost. Um, last downside is that we need to index all the headers that have been processed. Why we need to index them? Because if I want to update, uh, access a specific block header, I need to provide the Merkle path because as we update the Merkle tree uh, and we just store a root in the contract itself, then I need to know the path, right? So I need to index the data and, and essentially once I, it's the moment that I want to access it, I need to provide the, the Merkle path. This approach is okay. -ish. It's, I wouldn't say way better than the previous one, but it's way cheaper. Last approach. So there is a very cool primitive called Merkle Mountain Ranges. Love it. And the idea is let's do the same that we do previously inside the snark. So we can provide this tremendous amount of data as a private input to the circuit and essentially do the same computation like unrolling um, inside the circuit itself. And now we have a public input, which is the block hash. So essentially the commitment from which we unroll it. So the trusted input, the public input can be literally asserted when we do the on-chain verification. And why we unroll it, we can accumulate inside a Merkle tree or a Merkle mountain range. Why a Merkle mountain range is is cool because well, well let's imagine that you want to have like seven gigabytes of data processing once in a like the proving time is going to be horrible and why would you even like prove this commitment for like the entire history like do you really need that probably not so let's chunk it like into smaller pieces and Merkle mountain ranges are a pretty cool primitive that allow to do this to do to do this to give you like a, a bit of intuition how how does it work 
it's essential think of it as a tree of trees um yeah so once we do all this proving like off chain we simply verify the proof on chain as you know like verifying the proof is is way cheaper than doing this directly on the chain and still we just provide a merkle path and that's it we essentially have access to any sort of data we want let's do a recap again so approach number one on chain accumulation on chain compression off chain compression three categories prover overhead gas cost storage cost actually gas cost should be computational cost okay so prover overhead on chain accumulation do we prove anything well not really so we are happy on chain compression well we still like need to update the merkle tree i think actually there is uh, there is an issue here so i'll just skip this part off chain compression we are very very sad because well we need to prove actually significant computation so the proving time is significant okay now in terms of gas cost the third approach is horrible because it just costs a lot because we do the entire computation on chain compression well we are a bit happy because we just do a bit of computation but still it's a lot of cold data a lot of computation but lost at least not so much storage storage cost uh, oh sorry gas cost in the second approach while well, we just verify a proof so it's cool um okay storage cost for the first approach well seven gigabytes of data it is horrible so we are very sad on-chain compression uh sorry storage cost for on-chain compression we just store a, a root of the miracle tree so we are happy and in the second case we're even more happy because we again we just essentially keep updating a tree and we don't even need to post a lot post a lot of call data because the call data we post is literally just the proof so we're very very happy but again i don't want to say that all of the one of these approaches is the best one because as you see there are trade-offs and yeah so this part is actually pretty easy so as you know as you may notice here i was explaining like the second step when it comes to dealing with storage proofs and now there is the the last part which is essentially verifying the proof itself so approach number one is verifying the proof directly on the chain approach number two let's verify the proof inside the snark and then verify the snark approach number three let's ver verify multiple proofs inside the snark and then verify the snark we can aggregate multiple snarks together and so on but obviously there are some trade-offs especially when it comes to proving time um and yeah, so now, why the first approach is feasible on, on ZK rollups, for example, on StarkNet call data is very cheap. And what we want to avoid in this specific proof is call data. So this approach is, for example, feasible on StarkNet. But for example, if you want to verify like a proof on Optimus where call data is very expensive, you want to reduce it as much as possible. So for that reason, you, you might want to use a snark. And finally, if you have like many slots that you want to prove why can't you just verify them inside one snark you're gonna pay improver time but you just present one proof at the end so this approach is cheaper is the, most, the cheapest one but only if you have multiple actions to to take um, so there are trade-offs so let's identify them categories prover overhead latency verification cost so Verifying the proof directly, prover overhead doesn't exist. Latency doesn't exist because we don't need to prove anything. Verification cost, well, it is significant because we need to pass call data and we need and we need to do the actual computation. So like going through the entire path and each step in the path is one hashing function. Oh, and also let me get back to the previous slide. I forgot this is very important. Why wrapping inside this wrapping inside this arc is pretty important if you're like dealing with a storage layout that is using a specific hashing function let's say for example peterson peterson is not available like on on, on the evn like you, you just need to implement it. it's not the pre-compiled so it's, it's gonna be costly but if you do inside the snark and peterson is pretty snark friendly snark friendly then well you just verify snark on the one and you abstract it so it's gonna be way 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 cheaper but again there are trade-offs let me get back to this. So I went through the standard Merkle Patricia tree, Snarkified proof, proof of overhead. It exists. So we are not super happy. Latency, we're also not happy because we actually need to spend time on, on proving this, this, this thing. Verification cost, we are happy because, well, we, we just verify a proof, so it's fine. And 
start notifying multiple proofs. The prover overhead is still there. Latency is still there. It's even bigger because it takes a bit longer in improving time. And verification costs, we are super happy because essentially we can mutualize the cost of verifying multiple proofs by just verifying one single Stark proof. Okay, went through quite a lot of things. Let's put this all together. So let's imagine we have three chains and we want to have interoperability, interoperability between them. So we have chain Z, chain X, and chain Y. So it all starts with a message, aka commitment. We send a message in order to get the commitment. So let's say that we send a message from chain Z to chain X, because on chain X we want to access the, the state of chain Z. So what do we do? Once we have the commitment, we literally recreate all the headers using one of the three approaches. And once we recreate it, the header is still the point for which I want to prove the storage. I just verify a proof, and again, for verifying a proof, there are multiple approaches. But now, let's say that on chain Y, I want to access the state of chain Z. And there is no direct communication between chain Y and chain Z. So it must be routed through chain X. By the way, I'm like talking about this in a pretty abstract way. By, by chain X, I just mean Ethereum later one. Um, yeah, so from chain X, I'm just going to send again the commitment about chain Z as a message and then simply recreate all these all this headers. As you may not, uh, notice, it's pretty redundant because we perform the same computation on two different chains. And we don't need to do that, especially if you use like the third approach, which is generating the proof on chain. Um, but now there is another problem. How do you actually know what you should do? Like you need to be somehow aware of what is happening. And for that reason, uh, we introduce a, an API. We don't expect like developers to deal with all that complexities, choosing the right approach for the direct thing. Essentially, right now our APIs uh, optimizes cost-wise. Uh, soon we'll be able to optimize latency-wise. Um, and yeah, and essentially that's it. Um, that's about our API. I highly, highly encourage you to check this out. Um, and yeah, like a few final words about the API. It acts as a coordinator. It optimizes the costs. It optimizes the cost because we can batch multiple things. And once the job is done, you get a notification like via webhook, uh, via an event, like whatever you want. So essentially, we, you're not, you don't need to be like an infrastructure maintainer, and you can just focus on essentially building on top of this primitive. And I think that's it. Um, questions? So the API essentially is a REST API for now. We also have a JSON interface. We have off-chain on -chain entry points. So we can request the data like by making off-chain call, like calling a REST API or like calling a JSON RPC method. Um, or if your smart contracts like wants to access this data, then you just emit an event. We're gonna catch the event. And later on, like after a bit of time, feed this uh, the specific data inside the smart contract. So we have like a bunch of interfaces. And by the way, speaking of like the off-chain entry points, once the entire like work is done on our side, you can get a notification. It can be like a webhook. We can like send you a bit of information like using a WebSocket. Uh, it can be essentially whatever whatever you want. Oh yeah, so uh, that's actually a great question. So different chains use a different like storage, uh, I would say architecture. They might commit to a Merkle Patricia tree, Merkle tree, uh, maybe even Merkle tree. And obviously, like I said, having a generalized uh, verifier is like pretty, it, it's not a clean approach. So we essentially abstract it by using a snark. And inside the snark itself, we just uh, do the proper work like you know, we go through the through the tree, like through the through the um, through the elements of the proof, and then we can like use a specific hashing function. So, for example, now Poseidon Poseidon is uh, is is pretty popular. Um, 
I think that Scroll uses Poseidon and also ZK Sync uses Poseidon. On the EVM, like performing Poseidon will be pretty expensive. So for that reason, you cannot verify the proof directly. But what you can do, you can do the entire verification inside the snark, and then on the one you don't really care what the snark is like doing. You just just verify it. So that's how we actually deal it, deal with it. If we need to have it abstracted, we have it abstracted. If we don't, then we just don't. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's actually a good question because I think I went super technical. Uh, so actually, what we do at Herodotus every two weeks we have some internal hackathons, and right before the merge, uh, we build a proof of concept that we call the merge swap, and essentially we allowed anyone to dump their proof of work if on proof of stake and the way how it works we literally build a bridge on top of this technology and the bridge works in a way that you can lock your if proof of work inside a smart contract on if proof of, on the if proof of work chain you can prove that you've done it on ethereum proof of stake you can once you the proof is verified you can meet the erc20 token and you can do whatever you want with this token. And then if you want to withdraw back to Ethereum proof of work, you just burn it, you prove the fact that you burned on the other side, and, and yeah, that's it. Also in terms of uh, other use cases, I think that cross-chain collateralization is pretty cool because this is the place where you want to avoid latency as much as possible and you want to be asynchronous as much as possible. And essentially that's that's what we do here because our latency comes only from from the proving time but again using some optimistic approaches and so on there are a lot of things we can do here i hope it uh, answers the question okay i think that's it i have like three minutes so i guess we can wrap it up and yeah thanks <laughs>